Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, I'm an attorney. I've been an attorney for almost 30 years. Uh, for a long time, I was in the Washington, D.C. area with a small firm that I helped start. And uh, we, were, we took on big antitrust cases, monopolization, price fixing, uh, class actions against major corporations. And, um, and then when I came to Colorado in 2003, um, I still practiced with my firm for about six years. And then I just decided to start my own firm. And I started getting calls from people around the front range with problems that, that were popping up in the Greeley area and Weld County, especially about, well, oil and gas was coming into their area. And, and, and what could they do about it? And, and I'm not e even sure why I started getting those calls, but I did. Um, I have a constitutional law background. I also have a journalism degree. And so I have a First Amendment, you know, free speech background. Um, and so all of, I started putting all of that, all of my skill sets together to try to analyze this problem. Now, keep in mind, this is back in 2010. Right, so the, the beginning of this this fracking, um, what became the boom, right? And um, so the problems were already starting to crop up, but they weren't moving into neighborhoods yet. It, this was still relatively rural. And, and I'll talk a little bit about why that has developed that way. but. In, the, in that period from 2010 through 2016, I helped um, communities uh, figure out, well, you know, different strategies for how to um, protect themselves. And then it became, how do you protect your community? Because it became a community issue. And the uh, city of Longmont, the activists in Longmont passed a ban on fracking in 2012. Um, Broomfield, I helped them uh, get their initiative on the ballot in 2013. Um, and um, and I, so I was helping communities with the right of initiative, right? A constitutional right, Colorado constitutional right. And so that's kind of, and, and in the process, we've had some court decisions that, that at the Colorado Supreme Court in the Longmont, Fort Collins cases, that I'll talk briefly about um, that I, I then started having to analyze well, certain core issues. What is really keeping people from um, protecting themselves and protecting their community and having, exercising some control over their, their own local uh, governance? So that's kind of how I came to this process. Now, so let's go back. So it's called the Martinez case and our evolutionary predicament. Uh, just if you don't know, the Martinez case is a case that was brought um, on behalf of some teenagers. Uh, they're called uh, Earth Guardians. Chetesco Martinez is um, now a world-renowned uh, climate activist, and um, he's also, um, I, I won't say, uh, he, he's a performing artist really, and just a, a powerful, powerful um, young, young man. He's, since he's about 11, age 11, he's, uh, I, I think he's Aztec um, origin, and, um, and it, some of his ancestors are also from Mexico. So um, they brought a petition before the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the COGCC, set in 2013. 13, 2014, asking the, the commission to stop all oil and gas permits until they could demonstrate that there wasn't adverse, adverse health impacts and impacts on the climate that would um, exceed, you know, limits, right? Due process limits and constitutional rights limits. And so they brought the petition. The COGCC denied the petition, and that was fairly uh, predictable, right? And they used all kinds of rationales for denying it, including 
what I'm going to talk about here a little bit is about the precautionary principle and, and the, the Martinez petition in the first place was asking for the COGCC to apply what's called the precautionary principle. So next slide. So what is that? And you've, you've undoubtedly heard of it, right? And some of you probably know what it is. But in a nutshell, when an activity raises threats of serious harm to human health, the environment, or wildlife, preventive measures should be uh, taken, even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established. Now that's, that's a critical last piece, because the oil and gas industry for, for a long time has battled um, citizens and uh, people who have brought cases that are based on personal injury, let's say. Okay, I'm, you know, I'm being harmed um, by oil and gas development in my area and it's causing me personal injury. And so the oil and gas industry has always fought those cases based on, well, you can't show causation. You can't show that you didn't already have some of these health impacts, right? Or this isn't genetics, or this isn't something that another operator in the area caused, right? And so causation has always been their sort of go-to uh, in their toolbox, right? Because they, they've controlled that, that sort of field, right? Because most people, you heard uh, Dr. Oeskowitz, I believe is her name, um, talk about it. she had to do baseline testing on her son, but because she's a scientist, right? She understood that if she's really going to going to have something to show that that says, okay, I've I have this test, and I need to show, well, what was the test? What did the test say before I um, moved into this area, or before? I um, started um, taking tests for, you know, VOC levels. I have to know, well, where are we at already, right? And most people don't do that. And so they would lose cases because of causation. Now, this also came out because in the Martinez case, the petition said basically, well, it, we, we presented at the time 45 pages of studies and including climate change uh, scientists and health professionals and oil and gas industry um, analyses and to show just overwhelming impacts, right? But we showed that threats of serious harm to human health and the environment were present. Right? And all kinds of studies from the physicians for you know, social responsibility. And, and this was 2014, so there's a lot that's happened since then. But even then, there were, there were quite a few studies that had been done. And so we presented that to the commission. And the commission, the CDPHE, the Department of Public Health and the Environment, at the time Larry Walk was the head of that, they are responsible for consulting with the COGCC, the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, to say, okay, from a health perspective, from an environmental health perspective, here's what we, we recommend you, the commission, do about this petition, right? So they consulted and they took one sentence from our petition that said, all of this, all of this information we presented, it presents overwhelming um, evidence of harm to public health and the environment, therefore you should stop permits. Well, the Department of Public Health and the Environment said in their consultation, well, we've looked at the studies that you've presented and, and we don't think that they show overwhelming, conclusive evidence of harm to public health and the environment. Now, so let me describe for you why that's a huge problem, all right? So let's say I'm in a, I'm a lawyer in a civil case where only I have to show, all I have to show to a jury is a preponderance of the evidence. It's more likely than not that I've been harmed, 
by this activity, by the defendant's <coughs> actions, right? And the judge says, no, no, you have to show, now, at, at the jury trial, I tell the jury, you've heard from all these witnesses, I've presented overwhelming, beyond a reasonable doubt that this defendant caused my client's injuries, right? But I only have to show a preponderance of the evidence. I only have to show it's more likely than not. And then the judge says, okay, now I'm gonna throw this case out because you said you had shown beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had caused your industries, I I injuries, right? Now that's a criminal law standard versus a civil law standard. So they, they take a statement that you make and they change the standard. Right? So the standard at the CDPHE in the Martinez case wasn't, wasn't that you have to show conclusive, overwhelming evidence of harm to public health and the environment. But that's what they took and said, turned it around and said, you haven't shown that, therefore we're going to recommend oil and gas permits continue as usual. Right? So they flipped the standard. First of all, they say you can't show causation, and then they flip the standard and they make it a tougher standard than they really should have. Because their statute that they're supposed to be governed by, the Oil and Gas Conservation Act, had a provision that says it's in the, oil, it's in the interest of the state to foster the responsible, balanced development of oil and gas in a manner consistent with the protection of public health and the environment. So all we really had to show was that there were, that oil and gas permits were inconsistent with the protection of public health and safety. But they turned around the standard, made us, imposed a much tougher standard, denied the permits, denied the petition, and then we were forced to go to court, right? So, next slide. Can, can I ask a brief question? Um, if you can hold your questions until the end, all right? Um, now, we went to court, we went to the district court, and we lost there. The court sided with the commission. It basically said, well, the commission ha had presented all several reasons why they denied this petition, and we're going to give deference to this agency, right? It's something called the Chevron Doctrine, and I won't go into great detail about that, but it's important. Uh, it will become port important when I tell you about the, how the case developed, right? So we took an appeal to the Court of Appeals. And at the Court of Appeals, we won, all right? Because the Court of Appeals said, well, when we read this statute in its entirety and we harmonize all the provisions like we're supposed to do, the clear language of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act, the Act, Supported by the Act's legislative evolution, the Act had been uh, amended several times over a couple of decades to add more and more protections for public health and the environment. As oil and gas development got more and more dangerous and, and closer to communities, and, and so the legislature was bringing in more and more protections, and the court took note of that, right? And the Commission's own enforcement criteria because at that particular time, the commission had on its website, its mission was, it said, we agree, we have to protect every time, all oil and gas permits has to, have to protect the public health, safety, and the environment. It must be met every time. So when we called them out on that, because they were switching their positions, they took it down from their website, and they scrubbed it. But the Court of Appeals found a screenshot so, so they included that in their opinion, right? And they said, according to all these things, it mandates that the development of oil and gas in Colorado be regulated, not fostered, but regulated, subject to the protection of public health, safety, and welfare, including protection of the environment and wildlife resources. Now, what does subject to mean? It means before you can issue a permit, you have to demonstrate, you have to show that it protects the public health and safety and the environment. That is something they is Armageddon for the industry, right? Because it's the precautionary principle. It means before you can do something, 
you have to show that it's not going to harm the public health. You have all this evidence that there are risks, right? That it that is likely to harm the public health in the environment. So that was a major decision, right? Now, next slide. So, wait. I'm sorry, back. So what the Court of Appeals did, and this is important for you to understand, they restored the floor of protection, all right? Uh, the agency had basically removed the floor of protection, that is, um, you have to show that you're protecting public health and safety before you can issue permits. The agency was paying lip service to that, but then in their rules, they would waive virtually any rule because the operator would come to them and say, well, that'll cost too much, or we can't really do that right now. And so the agency would waive rules, but the agency also took the position that it was required to balance, because the word balance was in the statute, they seized that word and said it, they were required to balance oil and gas development, fostering oil and gas development against the public health and safety. So, so by doing that and then enforcing that against any cities, for example, who wanted to go further in protecting the public health, then they removed the floor of protection and they imposed a ceiling on protection, right? That's deadly. Next slide. Now just this month, today's the first, last month, um, about a week and a half ago, the Martinez case went, had gone to the Supreme Court. The industry sided with the um, commission. They were both in the case together, right? So think about that for a minute, that the American Petroleum Institute, Colorado Petroleum Association, Colorado Oil and Gas Association, all aligned with the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission that's supposed to regulate those entities. So there's that, right? So they took an appeal to the Supreme Court and said to the court, well, well, they said several things. Uh, again, they were shifting around. But ultimately, the court ruled that there's a single provision in the act that says it the, the commission has the authority to regulate, mitigate, prevent, prevent significant environmental impacts from oil and gas development to the extent necessary to protect the public health and safety in the environment, taking into consideration cost effectiveness and technical feasibility. Now, Isolating that provision, of course, it looks like, well, the agency is supposed to, you know, ask the operators, can you afford to do this if we want to protect the public health here and issue these permits with limits or stop issuing permits? Can you afford that? Of course, you, you can predict what the answer would be, right? But the court was supposed to take that provision and analyze it in the context of the entire statute, right? Harmonize all the provisions, including one provision that says, the commission shall promulgate rules to protect the public health, safety, and welfare in the conduct of oil and gas operations, right? Not ambiguous. The court said, well, this statute's ambiguous, so we're going to look at, look at legislative history, and, and they chose a single phrase from a statement by a legislature, legislator when they were amending the act. And, and the legislator had said, well, when we're doing this, we're not intending to put the industry out of business. So the court said, that shows us that, that the legislature intended for cost efficiency, cost effectiveness, and technical feasibility to be, to be the considerations that the commission can use, all right? So now, what the court did was it said, because the statute is ambiguous, we said it wasn't. The Court of Appeals said it wasn't. But the Supreme Court said it's ambiguous. Therefore, under the Chevron doctrine, we defer to the agency's interpretation of their own statute. Okay? So it's like a closed loop, right? It's, a, it's circular logic. And 
And the agency, of course, had interpreted their own statute to require them to balance the public health against oil and gas development, right? So what they've, what they've done is essentially tell the COGCC, you have the authority to essentially ask the operators, can you afford this? Or can you do this if it's technically uh, infeasible? Right? Now, next slide. So this is what the agencies, this is what the commission's interpretation ends up with, right? When you balance the public health and safety against the oil and gas industry's operations. Because this is what happened in Windsor, outside of Windsor, in December of 2017. And I won't go into the details about how this happened. There's a great article, and I think it's High Country News, that's an investigative piece that describes on the scene uh, what firefighters were saying and what, you know, what first responders were dealing with, right? This was a massive explosion and fire that luckily it was outside of Windsor, right? But Instar, the uh, research group that you're going to hear from um, Detlef Helmick uh, later today, I believe, they were doing measurements at Boulder Reservoir uh, about air quality. And they noticed these huge spikes in benzene levels and, and uh, all kinds of other VOCs, big spikes. Then they heard about the Windsor explosion, right? And so they, they kind of reverse engineered the data and including wind data and this is 40 miles away, right, from the explosion. And so they reverse engineered it and basically concluded it, it was coming from that, that site, right? And it had been coming from that site before the explosion because there were leaks, right? There was a valve that had been basically stuck open during the completions phase of this operation, right? And then it, because it was cold, the inversion layer kept, you know, the methane and benzene close to the ground. It found an ignition source through, um, they started up a portable heater and it was too close to the, to the source of the leak, massive explosion. They barely contained it before these tanks exploded in the article that described that those would have gone off like bombs, all right? Now, so next slide. So the other thing that has resulted from this interpretation of the Oil and Gas Conservation Act is that front range air quality is basically trashed. And uh, even in Boulder County, the American Lung Association has given Boulder County uh, an F, right? Now that's for VOCs. And uh, our ground level ozone, right? Very destructive. Now it has, it has some uh, combination of sources, obviously, but they have also concluded that the dominant source is from oil and gas activity, not automobiles, right? So, if you live in Boulder County, the air you breathe may put your life at risk. I live in Boulder County. Boulder County is, is a place where oil and gas has wanted to go into for a long time. There was, I helped uh, Boulder County citizens get a moratorium in place in 2013 that uh, was supposed to last for three to five years. It lasted basically for a little bit more than three before the Supreme Court issued its Longmont decision and, um, and then ultimately Boulder County had to lift its moratorium. And so now, currently, Crestone, Peak Resources, Extraction Oil and Gas, they are going after Boulder County's open space because they need it. They need it for these mega pads. They need it for these huge operations. They're running out of places to put these things. 
the economics of fracking are such that they've got to consolidate these operations into, into single pad sites, right? Whereas they used to have multiple sites when it was out in the country, they could put a site here with one or two wells and a site over here, right? Now, these sites are now 36 wells on a site. In Boulder County, they're proposing 56 wells on basically a cluster on open space, all right? Yeah. Next slide. So this is what reckless disregard for public health and safety looks like. While the Martinez case was at the Supreme Court and while Proposition 112 was on the ballot, which would have imposed 2,500 foot setbacks for oil and gas uh, operations, the industry rushed in to the COGCC and just put as many permits applications into the pipeline as possible. Uh, and I won't go into the legal reasons why that is, but this is the reason why cities have to have the right to impose a moratorium, right? It's a, just a tool that's been used for a century, okay, to prevent industry from basically knowing that a law is about to be changed, and so they rush in and try to get their permits approved before the law changes. That's horrible public policy, right? And so we're asking the governor to impose a moratorium on oil and gas permits. There's a new COGCC director. Um, we're not necessarily optimistic about that, but that's what needs to be done, right? Next slide. Now, there is a new COGCC director, Jeff Robbins. He comes from, he's a, an attorney, he comes from a background of assisting municipalities in uh, land use regulation. So, on its surface, that looks good because, as I've, as I've told you, the Longmont decision was a preemption decision. It basically says, because the state is the dominant entity regulating oil and gas, in this state, it can preempt cities from passing regulations that go beyond what the state allows. Now, if you go to my website, minddrivelegal.com, you'll see I have a 45-page law article dissecting preemption. It's called Seizing the Initiative Against Preemption. And, and I've analyzed why the court is wrong about it, but that has prevailed. That imposes the ceiling on protection. Boulder County wants to do more to protect the public, their, their public than the COGCC allows. Preemption says, no, you can't. The state says this is how much you can do. We're going to preempt you from doing any more. That's the ceiling, right? Now, because the Supreme Court, basically in its opinion in the Martinez case, said, well, the COGCC has the authority to um, take into consideration cost effectiveness and technical feasibility, right? And we're, we're going to defer to their interpretation of the statute, right? Well, okay, the COGCC now has another opportunity to interpret the statute, right? And just because they have the authority to take into consideration those things doesn't mean they have a, a duty to do so. They have a duty elsewhere in the Act to promulgate rules that protect the public health, safety, and welfare in oil and gas operations. So we're going to be asking this new director to interpret the statute in accordance with the Court of Appeals opinion. Right? Now, you probably you may have heard about um, a judge in the Court of Appeals that heard our case in the Martinez case recently had to be basically removed from the bench because she had um, she had made some uh, statements about the, her fellow judge who wrote the majority opinion in the Court of Appeals case about her, called her the little Mexican and, um, uh, and uh, was racially biased, right? Two of our clients, Tesco Martinez, his, his younger brother is Squatley Martinez, they're <laughs> Latino. Uh, and so it was basically, you know, we felt there was racial bias in our case, and, and the judge committed other ethical violations. She finally had to resign just last month, right? But she resigned, announced her, res she didn't announce her resignation, it was, it was 
kept confidential until we got the information. And uh, the Supreme Court issued its opinion the next, the next week, right? And didn't make a single mention of it, right? So we asked the court to uh, stay its order and vacate the uh, Court of Appeals judge's dissent. She had the dissenting opinion, and the Supreme Court basically followed that dissenting opinion, right? The, judge, the court, the Supreme Court denied our motion, and so the, the Martinez case is now finished in the sense of, you know, it's concluded at this level. But the commission has now an opportunity to make a different decision. Next slide, please. So what's the goal? The legislature, as we speak, is going through different proposals to, to amend the Oil and Gas Conservation Act to basically codify the Martinez Court of Appeals opinion, right? Because it's the only one that harmonizes everything, right? It restores the floor of protection and also removes the ceiling on protection, okay? Because once you say that you have to protect the public health and safety and the environment before you can issue permits, that's precautionary principle, right? Then we get to use preemption, all right? To say, well, okay, if there are any local governments who aren't doing that, then you're preempted because the act says you have to do that, right? So that's what's at stake here, okay? Next slide. Now, we've been talking at the sort of the local level, but we all, you know, at least most of us understand that at the global level, we have to make a transition away from fossil fuels, right? So that's, that's what is the big picture, right? And next slide. So what's going on here, this is a system, right? The climate is a system, right? Oil and gas development is a system. Governance is a system, right? And so this is how systems work, right? Very basic, right? You, you have inputs, you make decisions, create a process, you have outputs, you have effects of that decision, you get feedback from those effects, right? You, and then you change your inputs, you change your decisions. You say, okay, that didn't work so well, so we need to make a different decision here. New inputs, new process, new outputs, and that's how systems are supposed to work, right? We have been suppressing feedback from our actions for many, many decades, right? And so we're getting, climate change is feedback, right? And we've been suppressing it. The industry's been suppressing information about climate change, right? So, next slide. This is what Joanna Macy, a great environmental speaker, has said. Any society that consistently suppresses feedback Closing its perceptions to the results of its behavior is suicidal, right? And that's just a fact. And so we've been exhibiting suicidal behaviors, right? And so that's what's at issue here. Now, part of what's happening in this, in this proceeding, in this symposium, is you're reducing feedback, or suppression of feedback, right? You're overcoming suppression of feedback. You're getting much more information out to people. Right? You're, you're, you're countering, you're debunking um, arguments by the oil and gas industry. Right? All of that is necessary because they control, they use their resources to control the information flow. Right? That's, that's suppression of feedback because nature is providing the feedback. Next slide. So this is the system that we live in. Right? Energy, the economy, and the environment, they're all interconnected, right? Each is receiving feedback from the other, okay? And there are changes being made in every one of these. And equilibrium is the goal, right? Where energy isn't dominant and the environment is suffering and the economy is suffering because the environment is suffering. Right? We want to re reach equilibrium where all of these work together, right? Next slide. 
So, where do we go from here? I said we were demanding an immediate moratorium. We're asking for the COGCC to impose the Martinez standard, right? In Broomfield, they passed an initiative, ballot amendment 301, that is a Martinez standard. And, and I'm in litigation in Broomfield to enforce that, right? And then we're going to challenge the pillar, what I call the pillars of coercion. Next slide. This is what's going on, all right? These are the ways in which the oil and gas industry coerces communities, coerces cities, coerces people into basically accepting 56 wells, you know, fracking wells on publicly paid for open space that's going to frack for miles in every direction, trash the environment, you know, threaten the public health and safety. Why, why would Boulder County accept that? because of these, okay? Preemption, I talked a little bit about that. Forced access to open space. In Colorado, if, you, if you're a mineral rights owner, you can tell the surface owner, you own the mineral rights underneath a piece of land, you can tell the surface owner, we want access to the surface estate to put our oil and gas well on your land, okay? Now that's been the law for quite, quite some time. But the law doesn't allow you to put an oil and gas well on the surface to extract minerals for miles in every direction, okay? That's a trespass. That, that exceeds your easement on that land. So we're challenging all of this, right? Force pooling of mineral rights. You've probably heard uh, that if you own minerals in this state and the oil and gas industry wants them, needs them, for its operation to go forward, it can go to the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission and get what's called a forced pooling order. Basically saying, we made you an offer, you didn't accept it, so the state's gonna force you to accept it, and it's going to penalize you for not accepting our offer, right? Last week, we filed a case in Denver in federal court challenging the forced pooling laws in the state of Colorado. And we are going to tackle this problem, right? Because this is the source of their revenues. They suppress the costs of their major input, minerals, right? They need minerals. And they suppress the price of those minerals, what they have to pay you for to lease your mineral rights by force pooling. Because they say, well, if you don't take the offer that we give you, we'll just get a force pooling order, right? And we'll take them and we'll penalize you. So we're challenging that on several constitutional law grounds. Next slide. So we're attacking the problem at the roots, right? The wild grass force pooling law said wild grass is a community outside of Broomfield. I'm co-counsel on residence rights, wild earth guardians, right of initiative litigation in Broomfield, right? Challenge, we're, we're upholding their Martinez standard. I'm counsel on the Erie Thriving case, which is suing the town of Erie, basically for approving and operating uh, a agreement with Crestone that we think violates their rights. And then there are other cases to come. Next. So where's the global effort go from here? Need to keep it in the ground. Divestment. Divestment's really kicking in right now. Okay? We need to have rapid reinvestment in the renewables. The new governor says he's going to do that. We'll see. I'm not sure he's prepared to do the others. Right? We need a full cost accounting. An issue that's coming up and that will be a major issue going forward is what's going to be the cost of cleaning up all of these abandoned oil and gas wells in this state. Right? And that's, that's, that's going to be the major issue I predict. It already is in Canada. It's a, it's a national scandal, essentially. And then climate change litigation is going on, and then transition trust funds are needed. We need to make the transition. We need to have the funds available to make it. Next. I'm running over time, I'm assuming. No, it's only 11, 11. Okay, good. So I've exercised one part of your brain. Now I'm going to exercise the other part of your brain. 
okay? I'm a co-founder of a group called Boulder Rights of Nature, in which the legal rights of nature are something that is expanding around the world, all right? Giving rights to natural uh, communities, right? Rights to a river in New Zealand, rights, rights to, uh, rights of nature are in the Constitution of Ecuador, uh, Bolivia, places around the world are recognizing what, what indigenous people have always recognized, right? Now, um, so what's going on here is the rights of nature, the environment, are essentially colliding with our rights to nature, our rights to energy, right? And our rights to resources. We have the right to energy because we need it to live. We have the right to resources, natural resources, as our habitat, right? But nature has rights as well. And so how that gets harmonized is going to be, I predict, again, a major issue that everyone's going to need to shift their thinking, all right? And Father Thomas Berry, who was a, a major influence on my a transition from my old law practice to my new law practice, okay? One of the great eco-philosophers in history said the goal is a mutually enhancing human-earth relationship, right? That's what, that's, that's how the, we reach equilibrium. We're to completely out of balance, right? Next slide. Now this is the earth process, and I won't go into great detail about these, but Trust me, I, I can unpack all this, right? So this is what Father Thomas Berry is talking about. Rights of nature and rights to nature, those need to be in balance, okay? Just like the, the lion has rights, the gazelle has rights. The lion may kill the gazelle because it has a right to live, right? The gazelle has rights to habitat. The gazelle has rights to play its role in the, in the earth process. So these are supposed to work in balance. Right? Biophilia is E.O. Wilson's, um, a great biologist, his term for our innate connection to nature. Okay? We, have, we have this connection to nature. It's called biophilia. When we increase biophilia, when we increase that, that connection, we increase biodiversity, right? So we've reversed these processes over many, many decades, centuries, really. We've lost biodiversity because we've lost biophilia. We've lost that connection to nature, right? And then nature cooperates. Nature is coherent when it works best, right? And then ultimately leads to feedback and equilibrium. Okay? So that's the earth process. That's how it should work. Now, the reason why I tell you this is because you have to have some space in the brain for what we want to see, right? Because we're bombarded with what we don't want to see. Next slide. So Einstein said, look deep into nature and you'll understand everything better. Now he was a pretty, pretty logical thinker, right? But he knew the power of nature. Next. And I'm telling you, you already are seeing this, but expect the unexpected, all right? Black swan events, unexpected events are occurring daily now. And you need to sort of just expect it to happen, right? That should give you hope as well, because the unexpected can, in fact, happen. Next slide. I'm almost done. Extraordinary young people are showing up. Right? Yeah, you got your next round of folks that are okay. ready to come in. So okay, I'm, I'm one slide away. All right, I just want you to know you're popular. Okay. <laughs> this is Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old Swedish climate activist who's gone on a school strike. She says, basically, once you start to act, hope is everywhere, okay? But if you just are looking for hope without action, you're just going to be disappointed. Right? So we need to act first, and then hope shows up. Next slide. And so this is what Thomas Berry called the great work. Okay? It's the great work. It's, it's the work. Are we going to make this transition to a sustainable world? Right? 
It's not just your work, and so it's not just your responsibility. The earth process is working with you, all right? Next slide. And it's the great work of the universe itself, all right? And you don't have to believe me because I know that it's true. And so if you trust these principles, if you trust that nature is going to help you, then you're going to find that we're going to make much more rapid progress. So that's it. Thank you.